the streaming. Okay. Oh, there it comes. All right, cool. Hello, I'm Raimu, and this is stream four on this project to resurrect an old tool that I wrote years ago, currently in C and C++, where you can specify a file format like GIF, and um, when you run it, it will, hold on, it will parse that file as long as I'm in the correct directory. See, demos always um, always have uh, <laughs> issues like this. Yeah, so given a format written in, in a domain-specific language that I came up with, we can um, pass in a file that matches that format to the tool, and it will kind of parse out, tell us what every byte and every bit in that file means. So I've been working on um, resurrecting this tool since I wrote it years ago, I um, have the core of it done, except for a few bugs that we found in the last three streams, and I do not have a nice user interface for it. So I'm continuing to kind of explore the tool and like remember what I did and kind of fill in those gaps of the knowledge of that happens when you um, stop working on something for four years and then come back to it. And when I feel comfortable that I kind of understand the project, then the next step is going to be to port this to Rust because I'd like to have the uh, work I do in my spare time, my hobbies that I do on Twitch to be um, in Rust because I don't get an opportunity to use that anywhere else. So that was weird. I got like a request to join a network. Does that mean this network connection is not working? Um, what should I look up? Let's look up Rust. Oh, it looks like it still works. Interesting. Yeah, someone last stream showed me about um this thing called IM Hex, which is looks very similar to the tool that I was that I made. I don't want to look at it too much because I don't want to steal any of their ideas. I kind of like coming up with these things on my own. Uh, this is the GIF that we're parsing. It's a humorous little one. <laughs> so I have it in my project here. But if we open it with hex editor, you can see this is what my code has to deal with. This is what the what a GIF file looks like internally. Hey there, Betseg. <laughs> exactly. Lol. So we're able to parse that the first three bytes is the signature next three is the version and then the next two bytes little endian is the width and so on so my tool is only able to parse as much as we can specify in this formats file so this is a domain specific language so it means it's a language that is specific to a particular area of focus in this case it's parsing so what's kind of cool about the format I came up with, and also what I've seen other tools similar do, like IMHex, is that you have these constructs that, from the outside, they kind of look like functions because you have like a name with brackets, and then you have you have like statements, and you can have loops, and you can have conditionals. But what's different about this is that they also represent data. So this GIF or GIF function-like thing also describes the composition, the data composition of a GIF file. Friend said German is little and you can't get it out of your head. I mean like um, the ordering of, of words and phrases and or sounds and words maybe. So does that mean is there is there like a reverse Polish language out there? <laughs> so yeah, anyway, uh, perfect example this GIF or GIF thing looks like a function but also kind of in another way looks like a structure because it mirrors the actual structure of a real gif file and so i to test kind of like to test the what's this snap t i don't care about that the um to test the the my parser make sure um, i understand it well enough i'm going through this exercise of writing out in my dsl 
um, how to parse all the parts of a GIF file. And along the way, we've run into a few things that um, needed to be fixed and added some features, like this plus means something new now. 23 is Dreun Zwanzig, 3 and 20. I see. <laughs> it's like the least significant part first and then the more significant. English, like, has some of that in, like, older style English, like, four score and seven year. No, that's the other way ar ar around, right? <laughs> um, yeah. The English is taken and or borrowed a lot from German, so I guess, I guess that makes sense. So, yeah, I've added um, syntax since I started st streaming this work. This plus didn't mean anything before. It was a syntax error. Now what it means is when we parse this 8-bit field and we call it next, we are going to look ahead, as in we're not going to actually use up the bits or advance the file pointer. We're just going to look at the current position in the file ahead 8 bits, parse it out as an unsigned integer. That's what the UI means and then rewind the file back to at the beginning. So that's that's what we call a look ahead. So we're looking ahead 8 bits to see if it's 3B. Then we're going to break out of this while loop and we're going to interpret the trailer because as you all know, I'm sure, every GIF file ends in a 3B. And if you didn't know that, well, now you do. <laughs> it's called the trailer byte. And if I were to show you in the, in the Git specification, it's always the end, and if we look and find where they specify what the trailer is, it's always a single byte, and it said, it'll say down here that that byte has to be 3B hex. Right here, it also says it. So, the problem is that before the trailer comes zero or more data blocks, so to know if you're like, it's easy to know the first thing is going to be the header and the second thing is going to be the logical screen. But the thing we don't know is, do we actually have a data block or do we have a trailer? And to actually look at, to actually read the first byte is, is premature because we don't want to, we don't want to read, or consume any data until we know what we're parsing. So the look ahead is an escape hatch for that. It basically says, it peaks and says, is the next byte going to look like a data or look like a trailer? And if it's a trailer, then we know we're done with the data, so we break out of the data loop, right? Which is what this is saying. So we have that up, um, so far. Uh, one thing I wanted to have that I put on to do is um, I want to, if I have a name with an underscore in front, I want that field that's parsed from the file to just be ignored, to be, to be dropped. And actually, between now and last night, I, I remember that there is a construct that maybe already does this internally called the ignore statement. And I need to look into that. French is base 20 for numbers above 60. Yeah, I knew that. Um, and also above, um, what is it? Above 15, it's like 10 and 5, 10 and 6, 10 and 7. <laughs> 80 is is 420s. Hey there, 85 filter. Or should I say 420s and 5 filter. So yeah, I need to, or I want to, um, update uh, the parser so that this field, when we parse it, we can use it in a conditional statement, but then to toss the value and, and not include it in the final report. The other thing I need to do is finish the specification because we got all, we got down to image descriptor and data. I don't have anything. I just have a dummy so that we don't end up being in an infinite loop. But trailers fully specified. This is little. This is how we do a, a little Indian unsigned int. Um, actually, you know what I should say is it's a little Indian unsigned int sixteen. Right, because that's what it really is. And that also means I really don't need to have a bound here. So why don't I just, why don't I just, um, what's the key to select the next? It's like Alt D, there we go. Remove the bound because we don't need it. Effectively, the bounds are internal. It's parse the next eight bits as the least significant byte. And then the next eight is the most significant. Shift that eight and add the LSB and return that. 
These other things like bit and UI and S are built-in functions or built-in formats. So yeah, what should I work on first today? Fill this in or work on this? Do I have the both of them on my to-do list? Yeah, figure out how to specify part to be excluded is that next thing. And then finish that spec is the other thing. Okay, here's some other things I wanted. Oh yeah, some cleanup I wanted to do. Um, yeah, this warning. And type conversion built-in functions. I guess those aren't as important to me. Let's look into this part because I think my grammar actually includes a kind of statement where we can ignore things. So here's the grammar for a statement in my parser's language, right? So we could have a part specification. So an example of that would be this. That's a part specification. That means this part of the header is called the signature and you parse it by using the string function and the upper bound is 24 bits. So the string is no, no bigger than 24 bits long. That's a part specification. So the identifier in that case was S. There was no look ahead because it's optional. That's what this op sort of is, stands for. The part was signature. There was no expression list for the arguments. There was no assignment for to an L value and the, there was a bound of 24. So this file, the .y format we're looking at, it's based off of Yak, which is an ancient tool for constructing compilers or parser generators, or it is a parser generator. It generates a parser, right? The parser part of a compiler, because that's what we're essentially doing. We're compiling this specification here into an abstract syntax tree that then we walk through while we're parsing the data. So. You specify how to parse things by constructing grammar rules and the grammar rules operate on tokens and the base tokens are things like names, numbers, symbols, reserved words like if, and we get that from our, 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 our text of our code by running it through a lexer. So lexer takes the individual characters or a file and turns it into a stream of tokens and then the grammar file matches strings of tokens and reduces them in, into higher order tokens until we're left with just one token at the very end, which is the program. Or in my case, I think I called it the formats. Yeah, formats. So part specification, um, if we find a string of tokens that matches that, so if we encounter in the program that, that will match that rule, right? what it does is it will go into a section of the compiler that, that runs this and it generates the data that's associated with the output token and then re then re reduces it down to this symbol statement body which will have a statement attached to it and um, the process of come of, of, uh, of running the parser is really just t turning all those tokens and into reducing them down to a single value, which is the entire program. And this would be just one state, one part of that. So somewhere here, there's going to be, oh, here it is. <laughs> we found it right away. It's like a part, except for all the bits are dropped and no component is added to represent them. So if we put a minus and then identify our argument list, actually, there was a bug in this argument list, right? That we fixed. So there's probably the same bug here, and I probably should fix that, right? What else is missing here? There's no, there's no assignment. There's no interpretation. And there's no look ahead. So we do need at least at either a part, you know, an ID, or a assignment in order to actually use that thing we parse. So I'm looking at this line, right? If I want to turn this into an ignore, I at least need I need this so that I can use it in the next statement. Double cry seven. Good morning. So if I were to use the uh, this ignore spec, I'd have to change it to um, maybe 
What makes the most sense to me is we do this um, op assign and then we make, since next is already a local, uh, oh, it's not, but we could define it as a local, right? If we did that, then loc what that does is it adds a name called underscore next to gif that is removed when the gif is done being parsed. So it's like a local variable, right? So if I were to write this completely, it would be minus UI plus and then arrow next. And I'd have to, yeah, I had to attach the look ahead bit and I'd have to allow an, uh, an L value, a, a copy. That's probably what I should do, right? So the, that means the grammar has to be updated a little bit. The op look ahead has to be added to the ignore spec. So we do it like that. And so does the op assign. That goes there. So the only real difference between the two is that we have the minus in front and there's no op ID. It's not there at all. Are you programming with C++? Um, using two languages today, C for the compiler and then C++ for the parser. So this code is all in C. It doesn't look like C because we pre-process it through a tool called Bison, which is a parser generator. And, um, but it'll, it'll generate a .c file, which, um, will basically convert a token stream input into a pro, into an abstract syntax tree. And that's what we use in the parser when we get down into like decomposer. Um, this component thing has a, uh, where is it? Uh, not the, not the component. I think it's, um, it's in formats, right? This format thing has a statement and the statement has, uh, it's a linked list and statements can have sub statements and all these, all these things It can have arguments. It can have L value. All of this is built by the parser generator and it's all in C. Um, but when we actually use it over here, when we're like looking for a format and then we're starting to use it and stuff, this is all in C++. This is where we're actually using that abstract syntax tree to do parsing. So when I'm updating my grammar here and I'm adding um, the look ahead and I'm adding the op assign, we actually have to um, use those, but it's not too hard. I'm just going to copy from the other kind of statement like that. And I need the um, L value also. So that goes there. So yeah, the only differences between these two Okay, that's a part versus an ignore. Um, this one has an ID in there somewhere. Part. And this one doesn't have a part, right? But that's fine. So this will um, run, but not actually do anything right now until we um, actually update the parser. But I should be able to build the... Um, compiler part and test it. So let's do that. Parse format is the compiler. Build that. Go to the terminal. Um, let's use another shell for it. So build VS code parser. So parse under stage the, the gif uh, format. And we got a segmentation fault. <laughs> So I guess it's not as easy as that. Um, so you can see it's this is it's building that abstract syntax tree. Oh wait, it did it did parse it. It's the report that had a segmentation fault. Okay, that's interesting. Huh. I wonder why we got a segmentation fault in the report generator. Is that worth maybe uh, running in the debugger and seeing it happen there? And how would I do that? 
These are all great questions. So I'm glad you asked, Rama. <laughs> what do you think, sir? The key to be good programming. I think the key to be a good programmer is to be open to learn new things. So you're going to be learning different programming languages, different data analysis, algorithms, tools, ways and philosophies of building things, testing things. They're, they're like an expansive, huge set of those things that you're going to want to always be learning something new about, and you're never going to learn enough. You're going to, the more that you stay open to learning new things, the, um, the better you'll be as a programmer. And eventually you won't even want to call yourself a programmer anymore. You're going to want to call yourself an architect or a guru, right? Um, a developer. The, the word programmer is now kind of these days looked down on as like someone who just implements, just writes lines of code and doesn't think about like how to design things or how to, um, how things should fit together. It's more like the grunt work. So there's number one. The key to being a good programmer is not to be a programmer, but to do more. Uh, but I, yeah, I think it's about learning, about uh, not considering yourself done in the learning department and just um, always trying to um, expand your knowledge. So oh, that includes being open to being corrected. So if someone reviews your code and doesn't like parts of it, you need to be open to their point of view and try to see it from their perspective and, and, and learn from that. So you might think that you're a great coder and you write this awesome code and someone else looks at it and they might say, well, I don't understand this part. It's really complicated. If you have the reaction of, well, you're just not a good programmer. You can't read my code. Um, you're kind of closed off from, you close off the path to learning, and so you are going to decay. I think it's more healthy to say, well, this person has a different, persp different perspective. I can learn from that. Let me see it from their point of view and see, like, what is it that I could do in my code to give them a better experience and relieve them of the sense of, like, that they looked at my code and it was too complex? They might have some insights, like maybe I need to have better names, or I need to have smaller functions, or maybe need to organize the code a little bit differently. So that can be a powerful tool to be a good programmer, is it, being able to receive criticism and, and remain constructive. Okay, so segmentation fault. I am open to you, compiler and computer. Tell me why you faulted and dumped your core. Problem is that I need to be able to run that. Actually, can I just run it in the debugger? What if I just run LLDB? I don't have it. GDB? Ah, oh, we have GDB. I forget how to run things in GDB. Do I have to run this with this in front, maybe? I think that's how you do it, right? GDB and then the then the then the thing to run. Okay, cool. So we got Oh, hold on. Um it thought the whole thing was a command, right? Okay, the first thing I should do, I guess, is remember how to run GDB. So I'm gonna start like everyone should if they don't know anything and look it up on the web because we have this great uh, resource called the internet. So how, how to run GDB? Give me a getting started guide because I am dumb when it comes to GDB. Blah, blah, blah. Start it. I don't care about this. I just want to know the command. Starting. So GDB is my program, but how do I give it the arguments? Args. Okay, so GDB args. Okay, if it's normally started by this, you do GDB, what's a dash Q for? Well, we could try that. So it's GDB Q args in front. Let's try this. See, and that's great. What would we do without it? What? 
Ah, I don't know how I got into that mode, whatever it was. That seemed like an exotic shell mode. There we go. So go, uh, run. Ah, here was here's our crash, right? So reference. Look, let's get a back trace. So we're printing a statement, and then we're in the rendering of something, of a rendering a reference. It's probably because um, I set that L value reference, but I didn't initialize it. GB executable and then run args. Q is quiet. Okay. So you're saying that if I um, didn't have the Q in front, it wouldn't be quiet? <laughs> oh, yeah, you get all this front matter, right? That's nice. I think that's great because that's something maybe we'd be interested in reading the first time, but it's sort of superfluous after that, right? Okay, so we can kind of keep that up actually while I look and see. Um, so we're on formatting rendering .cpp line eighty one. So uh, go to what's the go to line again? Control G, so that's Control Control G, eighty one. Okay, so we crash right there on appending. I guess it's dereferencing this next reference, right? Yeah, this this looks like a bad pointer to me. Oh, the reference is null. That's what it is. Okay, so reference was null. So that means um, next reference is also null and we dereferenced it. So, okay. How do we get here? And render reference. Main line 151. Main of parse format. 151. A local. L value. Well, that's that's not what I expected, actually. So the local that I had was um, this one, right? So it crashed trying to print that. Huh. Okay, so this is an unrelated bug. This bug must be unrelated to the work I did here. But that's good. We need to fix it. If any kind of bug we find, we want to fix it. So why is the L value of the local statement null? Let's see what happens. Where do we actually set up a local statement? Local. Here's a local statement. Okay, well, for one thing, it's not L value, it's part. And the part is an identifier, not a reference. So this must just be wrong, right? That's not wrong at all. That's not right at all. It's um, it's statement identifier, right? Actually, it depends on how it's stored in the state. Oh, it's just it's part. Excuse me. It's not it's not identifier. It's part. Uh, what's the error here? Okay, so we don't want to render the reference. We just want to print it. Uh, how do we actually print? What, what, what am I doing for just... Oh, it's just that. So I don't, I don't need to render anything. I just print it directly. Easy. Like that, right? Okay, cool. So then... Exit out of the debugger. Build run this again outside of GDB cool so it it worked so we fixed the bug great so this is the abstract syntax tree of the compiler right that this is the compiled version of this so it sees that um, well it's it actually sorted it so I have to actually find where GIF is so here's GIF 
right? It says, well, GIF is a format. A part of it is the header, a part of it is the logical screen, and then we have a local called next, and then we have a loop um, with the condition being one, which is true, which means it's going to loop forever, and then we have an ignore, a format UI of 8 bits. So yeah, it's like I expected. The plus is being dropped, and so is this next, right? It's We don't see it in the, in the, in the report. Um, but then we have the conditional, which is um, the if, and then the conditional is if, um, and here's the condition, the expression. And then here's the statement inside the if, which is a break. And then um, we have the data part, and we have the trailer part. Hello, incredible striped monkey. How are you? I just fixed a bug. Um, it turns out that we were doing the wrong thing, printing out what a local statement looked like. And I just um, exercised my um, use of GDB and got a stack trace that pointed me directly to the problem. <laughs> So the problem is that we didn't want to call render reference for a local. It's actually a uh, part directly. So fixed it by going into the, um, where was it again? It's the thing that gen that prints the reports. Was it in main? No. Hold on. It said what it was, right? It's formatting rendering.cvp. Actually, I can click that and go straight to it. Isn't that cool? Um, except for it wasn't render reference, it was print statements. Uh, how did I get here? Print statements. Here, right? Yeah, there's there's where the bug was. So this used to say um, render reference statement L value. I think it's another case of a copy-paste bug. I probably copied it from, like, assignment. I copied it to here. And um, in assignment, the left-hand side is a reference, but in a local, it's not a reference. It's a part name directly. Feeling a bit scatterbrained today, but otherwise I'm good. I'm glad to hear that. Did you guys know that Stripe Monkey had so much to do helping me out with ideas that when I was making this keyboard, that his name is like, is like on the keyboard there, along with uh, three other people's names? It's true. <laughs> And if you're randomly watching my stream and saying, why is he holding his keyboard to the screen and what kind of lovely keyboard that is? Well, let me enlighten you. Here's the uh, link to the project. That was last year's stream project was to make that keyboard. Okay, so we fixed that. We can get AST, abstract syntax tree, and right. I wanted to update this so that when we're, um, where is it? When we're printing out this ignore specification that we also want to show if it has um, a look ahead and if it has an, um, a cop, an L value, a copy. So that would be under ignore here, right? Yeah. And while we're at it, we kind of want to update part as well because that also has a look ahead. So where, how do we want to print that? Probably right here, right? If statement look ahead is not equal to zero because it's C plus plus not C. Uh, then we want to kind of print a plus, right? And we kind of want to do the same thing for the ignore there. Do we want to put like um, spaces around it or something? That already has a space there. This one doesn't. We put one there. What does the ignore look like now? Ah, uh, I see. Well, but uh, part no part also does the same thing. So how does that look? Oh right, that's there and there. Okay, so I think we just leave no space between it. And I want to have that L value in the same kind of place. So that would be right here. Cool. So then build the compiler again and run it. Run it. <laughs> now what we get should be, uh, if I find GIF in here, 
Right. Now we see the plus there, and we see the arrow next, which is what I wanted. Okay, cool. Like a Jedi crafting his lightsaber, that's right. Now, some, some people propose that I make my own version of this thing called a mouse. I looked into that. Actually, there's a really cool YouTube video I found the other day on how optical mice work. And um, it's just way beyond me. You'd, I'd have to have a DSP in there that's doing, um, what is it, like 10,000 frames per second image comparisons. And it's like, cool video, but there's no way I could do that. <laughs> Not unless maybe the image sensor DSP combo like came as a discrete part that I could just use. Then maybe I would look into um, 3D printing um, and making my own mice. Although... My track record for buttons isn't so good. These things have worn out, like within a year. I've had to replace a couple switches already. Easier to make a mouse if you like a trackball. But don't you still have to have like very, very, very precisely engineered moving parts? Or else it's like really frustrating to use. Trackballs have a definite cool factor over a laser mouse. Yeah, but I would think that making the trackball precise and not annoying would be really hard to do. But maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Anyway, the, the 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 fact that mice are so much more complicated than keyboards kind of kind of scared me away from that idea. All right, so we're done with the abstract syntax free reporting. So I can close that. Rendering is done. Um, I want to get to actually using it. So if we actually switch over to decompose. and I try to uh, decompose it, I'm going to get a syntax error. Oh, because I haven't built it yet. Build. Now run. Cool. So we can close that so I can see all of this. So I think the problem is still going to be that that next flag. Next. Yeah, we get an unable to promote operands nil and 59 for binary operation from expression. It's a complicated way of saying that um, this was nil. It didn't get a copy because our ignore specification ig ignores the assignment, ironically. Also, the look ahead probably didn't work. Um, we can't see it there because it didn't get far enough, but it probably didn't do the look ahead correctly. So let's fix those things. Uh, first, the error. So the error is that this was nil and it should have gotten a value, right? So that's in the decomposer, probably where we handle... Actually, it's not decompose, it's execute statement because it's going to be a kind of statement. It's going to be an ignore, an ignore statement, right? Right, so ignore statement is kind of like a part specification, only it's missing some steps. I'm actually thinking maybe I should combine these two switch case statements because they're very very similar i bet if i diff them they'd be largely the same cannot ignore bits without a bit stream that's true and oh part you can not have a bit stream if there's a bound if there's a bound then you have to have a bit stream can't set bound so this is sort of different it is sort of different. So an ignore statement has to have a bit stream. Okay. Well, let's do the copy thing. That's in here, right? Um, find where it is. There's where we actually um, construct the um, reference to the part name part reference. The references identifier is uh, the part reference. Part reference is part or subpart. Subpart? What's subpart? Why would it be a subpart? Subformat? Where is that used? Here, I have, I have ancient documentation that tells me why. If a statement is part or ignore, this is the name of the format that describes the next part of the object. So what's, how's that different than this? 
optional name to give the part in the object's decomposed hierarchy. No name is given. The subformat name is. Oh, I see. Right, right. That has to do with the fact that you can just say header, and then that's the subformat, or you can say um, s signature. And so here, the subformat is s. The part is signature. So this would be like sub. Um, that that would correspond to signature and that s would correspond to subformat so yeah this is basically saying that um if we gave a part name use that if there's no part name use the subformat name okay that's good i understand it now all right so then we have to have found we have to have a reference otherwise it's an error Uh, do the balance checking if we care about it. Uh, evaluate arguments. Actually, I wonder if we probably didn't do that for ignores, right? Yeah. Okay, so that's a bug. I should make a contrived example to test that. Let me make a uh, to-do for that so I don't forget. Okay, so to-do is um, test ignore part with arguments i think it's broke i think arguments are not it's uh parameters i think parameters are being dropped being ignored i'm trying to get into this habit of like jumping to my to-do list to write things down before I forget because <laughs> I'm very forgetful. Go properly old school and make a ball mouse with rollers, but then I had to have very like precise rollers, right? I'm just not confident in my own 3D printing and small part engineering skills. Okay, anyway, um, after the argument list, we do the decomposition and there should be, oh, here we go. This is the part I want to copy. The L value stuff. So let's do that. Let's copy that and paste it down to ignore right here, right? So if there is an L value, then we want to call dereference and give it the value we gave. So the part does not, its part is ignore, right? Um, all of these things. So normally that ig the ignored value would be ignored. Ha ha ha. So instead now we are copying it to the L value reference. That's what this dereference does. Why do we have that check? Oh, because part indicates what what the component was right what, what component it is so it has to be some component which makes sense and then that it has to have a value no it doesn't have to have a value but if it doesn't have a value then it's completely parsed i forget what i use this complete for i think was that for like iter iterative parsing where you can just parse the top level and then skip the ones you can and then come back and parse them later. I think that's what it's for. Okay, so let's see if this works. Build that. So if this works, then this um, error here that I got before, um, what happened to it? Oh, because I did less, we didn't see it. Okay, yeah, that error is gone now, right? Yep, the composition is actually complete now. We have to scroll way up to see what we did before all the datas. Yeah, so we see now um, the uh, the look ahead is working, right? Because actually, it's not working. The look ahead is not working because we're skipping. See how we're skipping a byte, going from six ten to six twelve to six fourteen. So, yeah, this is broken. 
so I need to fix that. The look ahead, but at least the L, the L value thing is working because otherwise we, we're we getting an error that next wasn't found. Uh, that reminds me, um, I don't need to have this underscore in front anymore. Right. Should work without it. Yeah, it works without it. Okay, let's do the, the um, look ahead part. That was easy. Decomposer. So the look ahead part was just setting up um, a cleanup function, right? And where did I do that? I had, yeah, it was this extra, there was an extra parameter to decompose. That's all we needed. Is So it's there. So yeah, if look ahead is true, we re rewind the bitstream on exit. So we're basically leveraging this code right here that does it, which is pretty cool. We just get the current bitstream offset and then we add a cleanup function to set it back to that initial offset when we're done. Um, this technique of having uh, cleanup functions, it's kind of like my hack in C++ to do the equivalent of a um, finally block, right? Where you're saying when we're done with this scope, run some extra functions. And it kind of looks like this. It's pretty easy. It's, um, it's a class that where is it? It just has a vector of function objects and you can, um, where is it? Or, where, where? Oh, it's not even a class, it's a struct. That's right, because I directly peek into there to get the functions and just do it in place back, right? But all it really does is it has a destructor that loops through those functions and calls them. That's all you really need to do. Everything else is defaulted or deleted, all right? Super simple class or structure, actually. But very, very useful. So no matter where we return, we're going to be a, we're going to be calling that function when we return. Okay, so is that all I need to do? Just build it and then run it again? Okay, I have to be mindful of the time. It's 8.04 for me. In 26 minutes or so, I need to stop and get ready for work. Okay, cool. This is what I wanted to see, that it's not skipping bytes now. Uh, can I see it at a lower debug level? I can. So, so here we see the fact that it's, what, doing what? Oh, it's still in data. We're not seeing the next calls. What if I go down to lowest level of debugging. Yeah, here we're seeing like all all of the debug statements. Right, here we go. So it's um, decomposing that unsigned integer and then assigning it to next and then checking if next is 59, it's false. And so it's decomposing it as data, right? But when we get down to the end, it says, um, Decompose an unsigned integer. Is it 59? Yes. So exit the loop. Then decompose trailer. Trailer has a label. And again, it's reading from the same location, right? BC. We can't, actually can't see it when it decomposes that. So maybe I should print something for that. Anyway, um, there's where that same 59 comes out that came out earlier there because we rewound. And it was not not 59 so it passed that check and works c17r how are you doing how bad was it being 30 minutes late to your meeting yesterday um they said it was okay but you know i think i felt like i lost some political points but i did apologize to the meeting organizer and then i apologized to the next person saying i'm sorry that i made you sit there for 15 minutes while i finished up my report because i was late so it's like they had like several meetings in a row and I was scheduled for the 931 and there's someone else scheduled for the 10 o'clock one. So I came in right, like right before someone else. And then they had to wait while I gave my report. 
It's fashionably light, but it's also rude to two different people, plus a third guy who was there taking notes, so I needed to apologize to all three people. Which you should always do. If you inconvenience people, you should always apologize. Because otherwise, you're a jerk to them, and they're going to remember that the next time, and maybe not be so accommodating. Yeah, even though we're being fashionably late, it's still, like, it doesn't hurt to say you're sorry. And quite literally, I said, I thought the meeting was at 10, not 9.30. Sorry about that. <laughs> I seemed okay with it, but yeah, again, you always get that sense that you're losing some political points that, like, yeah, I need to make this up somehow. Like, I need to be, like, extra thorough in my report or, like, I need to be extra attentive to what they might be looking for and, like, yeah, give them some more um, of, uh, like, answers to questions that they have before they even ask, ask the questions. Then I'll be back on track, right? Okay, so we have the look ahead. We have the um, assignment, so it's all cool. So now we have... The ability to declare a next so it doesn't show up in our... Oh, we need to check to make sure it doesn't show up in the report. I don't want it to be there. That's why we made it local. And that's also why we had this ignore the minus in front. Kind of makes this look goofy, doesn't it? Because the minus means ignore the output. And the plus means rewind the input. <laughs> so hey, it's like, hey, uh, parse something, but you just ignore the output. And by the way, when you're done, go back. And as a side effect, make a copy of the output and put it into a local variable. Yeah, I'm not loving the syntax, but yeah, let me do the report and make sure that it next should not show up in the report. So here's the parsing report. So we get a bunch of datas, like a lot of those. Okay, and there's the header and its signature and version. Take a while to find this is your favorite mechanical mass. Ooh, cool. It's a YouTube video, though. How about I will copy that link, watch it later, and then report back. By the way, I love your handle, Binutils. Binutils are some of the greatest things that we use as developers and that we kind of um, don't, um, don't really think too much about, but we wouldn't be able to do any of our development without them. So... Thank you, Ben Utils. <laughs> okay, I'll look at that and comment later on the Discord. Okay. All right, it's all sorted. So the global color table is going to be huge, and I need to skip it all. So I need to hit this button a lot of times. <laughs> Red, green, and blue um, values for all the color table. Okay, here we go. I forget what triple asterisk means. Oh, that means it's an argument or something. I think that means it's um, it's a it's a it's a it's a value that got associated with the component, but it didn't have any bits associated with it, if I remember right. Okay, so here's where we have the uh, logical screen width and height, and we can see its composition. Yeah, so we didn't see next anywhere in there. That, that was the objective. It worked. So, double thumbs up. We have the, um, the fireworks. We deserve fireworks. Check Holly's unstoppable computer mouse. We had Rust C, and now we have Binutils. No, we had... We had been utils long before we had Rust C. <laughs> I'm not good at thinking of nicknames and sounded neat when you first installed Linux in ninety two. Hey, it's it's a great handle. I wish I had thought of it. It's also a very humble name. It's it's good to be humble, right? Humble and yet like in foundational and instrumental to everything we do. Okay, so we're completely done with this. This is just working. Um, I could take that off the list. That was this one. Marking it done. If I do this correctly, there we go. I'm going to have a follow-up to this for myself. So uh, we exclude 
apart by using an ignore statement. If we still want the value, we can make a copy of it using the um, L value reference, which looks like the arrow, right? Name. Okay. Okay. We. I. Yeah. Good thing I wrote this because I. I did forget to do. I. I did forget this, and I only wrote wrote this, uh, fourteen minutes ago. So I. I forget things for after fourteen minutes of writing them. <laughs> That's how bad my memory is sometimes. Yeah. We want to test the ignore part with parameters. So I need to have a contrived example for here. So, how about we do like. something like um maybe we'll just ignore the version but then we'll um inside of version so let's have like a version that takes like expected and we're just going to copy this so we'll comment this out for now right So then we'll have the version and then we'll say like, well, actually I should just copy this. If version, so it's, it's very contrived. So don't worry that I've like completely broken this, but so now instead we would say just version and then expected, let's say 89 a right. So since we're not doing an ignore specification, this should just work. And it does, right? So we have, I put version into its own format. So now ver is version version because of that. Uh, okay, if we wanted the version to escape, we would say return version, right? Now it escapes out right? It's, it gets the same value as the inner. But what if we told it now we want to ignore the version by putting a minus in front? I bet you this is broken. Yep. Uh, no parameter given for expected, right? Oh, uh, yeah. So that's how it's broken. We did give a parameter, but the code thinks we didn't. With the memory available today, most developers never need to worry about packing bits to save space. It's kind of a rare skill and helps you um, a good bit now that you have some interesting problems. Greatly benefiting keeping data in L1. I agree. Um, one's, one uh, one other uh, area where there's still a lot of bit packing is in protocols because there every bit counts. Also decoders, which is why like GIF uses it. Even if you were to design this today, you'd still want to um, pack these bits in. So where you have like, you see this a lot in protocols too, right? Protocols and in compressed bit streams, you'll have things like packed fields because flags only need one bit, right? So why make a whole byte just to have a flag? It's wasting all the other bits. And um, bits count when you're compressing. So back to where I was, I wanted to kind of, can I bookmark a text file, by the way, kind of want to have a bookmark for right around here ish, right here. Can I have a book? I can have a breakpoint. I thought I had bookmarks. How do I bookmark? How do I add a bookmark? Toggle Alt Control Alt K. So that's these two and K. There we go. I have a bookmark. <laughs> Easy. Now, if I wanted to get back to that, let's say I scrolled around. How would I do that? Remember me and my memory. Um, I'm glad the command palette lets me remember things. So it would be like so. It's Control Alt L. Control Alt L. There we go. Now I know how to get back to my bookmark. Let's say I want to have a bookmark there and here. 
Control K and then L. Look at that. Isn't that sweet? I can jump between those two places. Okay, so back to the to do. Right, we're testing ignoring, so it's broken. We need to fix it. So that's in state execute statement, right? Right, it's the construction of the arguments. It's this part. So we're not doing this. This needs to be copied down before, right before decompose for a limit, or for an ignore statement, right? So it goes right here. So part becomes ignore, right? Build that. Cool, fixed it. Fixed it. We get more fireworks. <laughs> so now it's completely ignored. We don't see it in, in here at all. So it's like, what happened to bytes three, four, and five, right? Well, they're being ignored. So if we did uh, the lowest level debugging, we should see it being ignored. Right, so we get into the version and we actually see that it's 89A and we and we see that it is expected and um but that's all we see right cuz it's properly ignored cool so let's fix so using my nifty new bookmarks jump back to here and fix this so that was just a contrived test What's the delete key? That's backspace. I'm forgetting the, the keys on my keyboard. I thought that was delete. Oh, right, so I have to hold that and hit that. Right, okay, never mind. I figured it out. <laughs> Problem with only having only having 36 keys is you have to um, remember all the shift states. Okay. Cool, so now it's back to decomposing the version number and checking that it's one of the allowed version numbers. 87A or 89A. And yes, GIF was invented in 1987. That's how old it is. All right, done with that. Alt D. Ah, uh, yes, it was broken. Yes, we fixed it. Gajif, that's right. I keep forgetting it's Gajif. It's not GIF or GIF, it's Gajif. So time to finish the Gajif specification. I gotta go, I gotta prep for a meeting in well I can I can stretch it a little bit. I have between ten and twenty-five minutes if I want to really wanted to stretch it. How much can I do in ten to twenty-five minutes? We can at least start like interpreting data blocks because we're at that point, right? Where um, we're seeing data, but we're just calling it dummy and moving on, right? So here's, we're parsing, we're legit parsing down to offset 6OD and then we're saying, well, no, no, it's just dummies. So I think that's the next part, right? Um, where's image descriptor found? It's not. I guess this was one of the kinds of data. L. Here we go. <laughs> Table based image. Right, because, yeah, I think I, I walked it through like a data it could be a graphic block, a graphic block could be. Um, a graphic rendering block, graphic rendering block is a table based image, table based image has an image just, oh, that's image is that two two, th two things or one thing? That's one thing right? One thing called image descriptor people say it's pronounced with a hard G cause it stands for graphics but then pronounced JPEG as JPEG like the P doesn't stand for photographic
Um, well, that's kind of like, uh, who is it, Primogen or someone else now says squeal instead of SQL? Right? SQL is pronounced, if I could type, squeal. How do you pronounce squeal? <laughs> Should we have should we have a pronunciation guide? Ga Jif Squeal. <laughs> Don't save. Okay, so I think that's why where I was getting at with image descriptors. Like I was following through like what are the kinds of blocks and I, I saw that thing there. Oh, right. It was because the actual first one in our um uh that we're parsing happens to be an image descriptor, right? If we go back up here, what did I do? I looked at like the first byte at offset 6OD and saw that it matched that. Where is it? Where's my lull? I must have closed it. Where are you, lull? You're under a uh, stage somewhere. Lull. Uh -huh. Hex editor, 6OD. Six O D. F E C here, right? Thirty nine hex is fifty seven. Does that sound right? Thirty hex is three times sixteen. That's forty eight. Forty eight plus nine is fifty seven. All right. So thirty nine hex or fifty seven. What is that in the spec? 39 or 57. It's nothing. Okay, so then why did I think that that was a... Uh, what made me think that that was... Let's see, I didn't remember my place. Why did I think that that was an image descriptor? I'm wondering if I have a bug here. Is that really the beginning of a data block? Or maybe I have a bug. Logical screen has a global color table. Global color table. Looks like what? What was that? Okay. Wait, sorted. Oh, okay. That's just for a hint for the decoder. Okay. Yeah, that's what we're doing. I, I, I guess it's okay. So that means that this really is the beginning of a data block. So I guess I just have to look and see what how that would be interpreted. Gajif or Jagif. No, I think it's Gajif. You like squeal better than sequel? Squeal. Okay. Um, there was a table here of like, here we go. We 
We should see a label of 2C. I don't see a label of 2C. I don't think that that's an image descriptor. What is that, though? 3958. I think we have a problem parsing here because it's none of these, right? Yeah. Okay, so what does that tell me? Six O D. It's definitely parsing uh down to here, right? Yeah. Those three are these three bytes. But is maybe I screwed up the start of the global color table. Aspect ratio is zero. That's re really f far up at the top right there. And so that's the beginning of the global color table. And it's 512 bytes times three. So that's three. Oh, yeah, it would be th three. Not six. It'd be three, not six, right? I think we did go too far. No, it's three times two times a hundred hex. So it is six hundred hex. So it would be six O C six O D, right? So are we off by one? We should six O D, not six O C. Six O D. Oh, I think I was no. Uh, I was looking at that the last three columns, right? At six hundred. It's difficult to scroll with this thing. Here. Okay. Well, unless I got the global color table size wrong, I think that's where. This doesn't look right, though. This doesn't look right to me. I feel like I'm missing something. This is consistent, right? A, F7, binary is one, and then one, 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 and then zero, one, Wait, why does it show up? Oh, hold on. Right, the sort flag is zero and the table size is one, one, one. <sighs> hey there is Matt. What got you what got me on this one? I made this thing um years ago and I wanted to um get back into it and resurrect it. How come my bookmarks aren't working? That's weird. So I made this tool that you can describe the format for anything. So in this, we're doing a good GIF, right? And my tool is both a compiler. So it compiles this to an abstract syntax tree. And then it uses that abstract syntax tree to actually walk through and parse a file. So in this case, it's a GIF file, right? And we get something like this as an output of it. And it's in C and C++ and I want to um, pick it back up, understand it, fix any bugs, in it, or then, and then move it to Rust and then give it a user interface. Yeah, we have reached the lower bound. I think I am going to get myself, I'm going to go to the upper bound because I want to I wanna at least figure out what's going on here. Like why it looks like I'm, either the global color table doesn't start here. I missed something. That is an unusual code though, for three ones. Shouldn't the first index be black or all zeros? It's hard to say. <laughs> oh wait, that's not the color table beginning. Uh color table no, that is that is. That's the um color background color index that is the uh aspect ratio 
That's the red, the green, and the blue for index zero. Maybe I have the num the table size might be wrong, right? So seven. Let's go back to the spec. That would be in logical screen descriptor. Makes me think I should bookmark this. There, it's bookmarked. Raise two to the value of the field plus one, so it'd be two to the eight. Wait, then I am off by one. It's 256, not 512. Okay, so then where's my bug? It's in color ta global color table size. No, it's not there. It's in um, color table size here. Oh, it's not two shift left. It's one shift left. Uh -huh. No one caught me on that. Two to the power of something is not two left shift. It's one left shift. Right? So one left shift eight should be 256. There we go. So it's actually 256, not 512. So yeah, okay. That makes more sense. So... Probably an easier way to seek through this, but anyway, I'm almost there. So the color table ends at 3OD, not 6OD. I should have known that. 3OD. There we go. There we go. So that makes sense. You can kind of see it. There's a string that says Netscape 2.0 in there. Um, Netscape, that's a blast from the past, isn't it? Who's, who uses Netscape anymore? Okay, so but that really does look like the boundary between the end of something and the beginning of something else, right? So 21FF, how would we interpret that, right? 21FF. Uh, the table right above here, 21FF. Application extension, right? So it's an application, there's an application extension block in there. Application identifier. Interesting. So Netscape 2.0 is the application identifier for this lull, lull GIF. Who would have thought, right? Who would have thought that this thing has a Netscape 2.0 application identifier embedded in it? Wow, this is just ancient, right? courtesy directory file located on CompuServe <laughs> in the PIX forum. Who, who here in chat even knows what this means? If I told you that I put a file on CompuServe in the PIX forum, would you know wh wh where to find it? Who, who here knows where to find files on CompuServe in the PIX forum? I don't, and I'm old. <laughs> OC17R, you do know where to go to find... Um, the courtesy directory file located on CompuServe in the PIX form. <laughs> That's funny. Anyway, um, oh, you can send email to Larry Wood, the forum manager, indicating if you want uh, something. <laughs> These historical nuggets that you find, right? Uh, what were we searching for? Application extension? Right. Okay. Application extensions contain application specific information. So there's an extension introducer, a label, and then a block size, and then the identifier, and then an authentication code, and then data sub blocks and then a terminator. Okay, so here we go. It's 21, it means it's an application extension. So 
I have just enough time to like parse this thing, I think. So in data, we have to look ahead again, right? Because we don't know what the block is unless it's 21. So I'm going to do the same trick here in data. So we have, don't have a dummy anymore. Unless all data blocks follow the same pattern of having a extension thing, they might. Uh, is there a generic syntax for a block, data block? Should probably use the index like a normal person would. Let's use the index. What's data? Okay, there is none. So scrolling through till I see data. That's a data sub block. This is this format of a data sub block, block size bytes. But is there a data? Blue, 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 blue. I probably missed it if if there was a generic data thing, but I think they're all the similar, right? Um, if it's a data block, it starts with like a, an extension introducer and then a label. So maybe we just parse it like that. Yeah, they're all introducer and extension introducer followed by label, right? Except for trailer, that's different. Yeah, okay, so then I'm going to parse them. I'm not even going to do a look ahead. I'm just going to call it. It's a UI called extension, and it's 8 bits, followed by a label of 8 bits. And then we're going to say if extension equals 0x21, then it's a um, application extension. Right? So application extension Go back to the spec. Uh, let me put up book. Whoops. Bookmark. No. No, no, no. Bookmark there and then go back into here and find. Um, I didn't bookmark the. Okay, I don't need that anymore. Um, application extension. It was there and I just erased it. <laughs> okay, got five minutes. Okay, so there's a block size. What does block size mean there? The number of bytes in this extension block following the byte size label up to but not including the beginning of the application data. The field contains the fixed value 11. Okay, well, and the label here has to be FF. So we can, let me bookmark that and go back to here. And we say um, if... Label is not e equal to FF. Then we got we got issues, right? Error. Bad label for application extension. Okay, and then we have a. a Block size has to be 11. Got two and a half minutes. Bad block size. If it's not 11.
Okay. So it's an 8-byte identif application identifier, and that's a string, right? And then what's this code? Sequence of 3 bytes used to authenticate the application identifier. An application program may use an algorithm to compute a binary code that uniquely identifies it as the application on the extension. That sounds very cool. Let's do the identifier first. S application identifier. And that's exactly 64 bits, right? And then the secret code. Let's just make it an unsigned integer. Um, what did they call it? They didn't call it secret code. What did they call it? Application authentication code. Authentication code. Cody. 24 bits. Okay, and then we have um, the sequence of data blocks followed by a terminator, right? And the way it works was, a, if I remember right, data block begins with the size, and if the size is zero, it's a terminator. So I think we can just follow, we can have like a common syntax for that. So it would be like data blocks. And we'll just have data blocks down here where we have like um, like a, a, a while loop, I guess. While one. UI uh, size eight. If size equals zero, break. And then we have like a bounded of size times eight of some things, right? I did that on purpose because that makes that allows me to skip it. Cool. So we don't actually have to encode. If we wanted to encode the Terminator specifically, I could, but I kind of don't. I kind of feel like the Terminator. Terminator, the block Terminator is just really an artifact of like a marker after the data subblocks. But then again, like if I wanted to be tr pure in the sense of like representing this exactly, then I'd want um, it to, I would block Terminator to be outside of this while loop, right? Okay, let me see if, let me see how, how I did because I'm out of time. Um, let's just see what I get. Bad label for application extension. What's the application extension? Application ex The label's 249. Huh. Did I mess that up? Is it like... What does the spec say? That um, extension label, FF, right? So what is it actually in the file? At offset, oh, we, we're off by a bit. Um, how did that happen? Oh, wait, no, it worked. It worked. It's just, uh, it went and tried to parse the next thing. Uh, it did work. So it found a data block. Um, wait, no, it didn't. What is this? Going into data extension, decompose. Oh, wait, no, I just need to scroll up. Um, Oh, here we go. It, it found it. I just have a bug at the after the end of this. It misinterpreted the next thing as another application extension. 
Oh, probably because there's more than one application extension. Okay, so I'll have to fix this later, like tomorrow. But yeah, it looks like we're parsing the Netscape application identifier. And their secret code is 3288624. Someone, someone call up Netscape and make sure that that is the correct authentication code for Netscape. That's your homework, um, chat. I would like you guys to make sure that that authentication code is correct. Let me know if it's not. <laughs> Okay, uh, maybe we'll just leave what if I turn this to two, we can see it better, right? Yeah, we see that it's Netscape and we see the secret code. And I'll leave that as a go to the end. All right, we'll leave that as a backdrop for GIF and we'll go rate someone. I gotta go to work now. I'm sorry. I hope you had fun watching. Who are we going to raid? Primogen says Haskell is faster than C. Um, I'd really like to watch that, but I have to work. But that doesn't mean that you can't watch it, so let's go watch him. Yep, bye everybody. Sorry I can't keep going, but I got this thing called job that I have to do now. I should be back tomorrow, though. So, have fun. See ya. Bye.